Hi, everyone. I'm Leah. Uh, here's a fun fact you might not know about me. I grew up in Greece, and specifically in the relatively unknown island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, one of the very few you'll meet. In other news, I like making stuff. Uh, you can find my open source projects on GitHub. I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group, and as my day job, I do HCI research at MIT. HCI is just a term academics use for like usability, user experience, that kind of stuff. So this talk is actually very close to what I do. And I've written a book. It's really good. You should buy it. So I asked the conference a while ago, which talk should I give? I, can, I have two ideas, an HTML secrets talk, or a JavaScript usability talk, how to write usable code. And they were like, we trust you, do whatever you want. OK, so as undecisive as I usually am, I kept trying, going back and forth, trying to decide for like until two days before the conference. I still hadn't quite decided which talk I was giving. And I was at this cocktail bar with a few other speakers discussing the news, um, Brexit, I'm sure you've heard. And I was like, hmm. Referendums seem to be quite trendy these days. Maybe I should do one. Maybe I should let the people decide. So I posted this tweet, and the people decided. The people decided JavaScript usability. So I'm sorry if you voted for HTML secrets, or if you didn't vote at all. Well, you should have voted. But I'm sorry if you voted for HTML secrets. The people have spoken. Yes, the, the percentages are pretty close. But hey, bigger decisions have been made with smaller majorities. So. What do we mean by JavaScript usability? It almost sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, we're developers. Isn't UX like one of these terms that designers use? Actually, if you look into these terms, usability, user experience, user interface, they don't really have that much to do with, they're not really that scoped to graphical interfaces, as you might think. Let's look at the definition for Usability. Usability is the ease of use and learnability of a human-made object. A human-made object can be a ton of things, not just graphical interfaces. Or user experience refers to a person's total experience using a particular product, system, or service. Still quite generic, right? And the user interface is everything designed into an information device with which a human being may interact. None of this about graphical interfaces. So yeah, something like this is an interface, actually it's two, the Google Sheets interface and the browser's interface, but this is also an interface. So this is a faucet, I actually took a picture of this last year in New York, it was in the bathroom of a fancy restaurant, it's actually a pretty bad interface. If you think about it, how do you, how do you get water out of this? How do you wash your hands? So you, th you see this lever at the top and you're like, yeah, I should probably like turn it or lift it, right? It, that's, it, it's an affordance, you, you're supposed to do something with it. No. The lever is just for controlling the temperature. It's actually motion activated. And whoever put this there knew that this was hard to use because they realized it needed documentation. If you look at the bottom right corner, it shows you how to use it. The whole point of motion activated faucets is that you shouldn't have to worry about this stuff. But they realized this is confusing. Also, a book is a, is a UI, remember, an information device. A book is an information device. The same principles apply. Slides are UI. This slide is a UI, so this can get a little recursive. And what is of more interest to this talk, your, your code is a UI. And I actually decided that I, need, I, I want to give a talk about this. I wanted to do it for many years, so I have a lot of projects on GitHub. I get a lot of pull requests. I, my projects have like over a thousand merged pull requests at this point. So I review a lot of code, and a lot of the time I get pull requests of someone really well-intentioned, really nice people. I love them. I love my contributors, but a lot of the time they're like, we need to add this feature, but they haven't really thought that how people use this feature, how to make it easier for them, it doesn't seem to be part of our thinking as developers, because we haven't usually been taught about UX. So I decided I wanted to do a talk about this. And the first thing, and what something that will be throughout this talk, documentation is a last resort. Do not expect that people read documentation. This is true in classical graphical interfaces. We don't expect people to read help anymore. 
But in code, we still make really sloppy decisions, and we're like, yeah, whatever, people can look up the docs, right? People don't look up the docs. Not when they're writing code a lot of the time, they just see existing examples and they try to pattern match, and they only look at documentation if, if things are going really, if, if, if it's becoming really confusing, and especially if they're reading code from somewhere. So do not expect that documentation will save you. Documentation is a quick fix that you slap on a bad UI to, to sort of help people somehow sort of use it. Do not, uh, do not depend on documentation. So one of the first principles of good UIs, which also applies to code, but, also, but pretty much any UI, is sensible defaults. The more sensible, uh, the, more sensible the defaults, the less I have to look uh, into documentation, uh, the less I have to worry about how to make this thing do what I want, because it already does what I want out of the box. So let's look at an example uh, from native JavaScript APIs that is not exactly as it should be. I, call, I, I will call these examples API hold of shame or poop. So how many of you have heard of the new URL class? Well, it's not new anymore, but how many of you have used the URL constructor? Not many, OK. So this talk serves two purposes then. Uh, yeah, we got native URL objects, so we can parse URLs um, and do cool, do cool things with them. Um, how, so you would expect that it would work like this, right? So I try to construct a new URL, I pass it like a file name, I expect it to resolve in the same way it would, resol it would resolve in a normal HTML link. Nope. Error. Fail to construct URL. Invalid URL. What was invalid about my URL? It's perfectly valid. I can put it in an anchor tag and it will work just fine, right? But no, you need to provide a base. You need to provide how, uh, how to resolve this relative URL because it's not absolute. I can do the, f the thing on the first line if it's an absolute URL. If it's not, I have to provide another absolute URL and it will be resolved based on that. So yeah, sure, that works just fine. Why can't this be the default? I don't know. I actually suggested it to what WG a while ago. Many people agreed. Other people disagreed. They were kind of uncomfortable with like dynamic defaults and eh, whatever. So, next principle, be liberal in what, you in what you accept. Do not force people to use a specific type uh, in, in your parameters if more, if more than one is reasonable. And in this case, the URL is actually a good example. Because yes, I can construct URLs with just strings. It works just fine. I can also construct URLs with other, through other URL objects. Still works fine. I can even construct URLs from objects that look like URLs, like location. Location is not a URL object. It existed before the URL object. Still works fine. So if, if, if you see people trying to use many different types as parameters and they fail and they have to look at documentation and realize, oh, yeah, I, didn't, I, 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 I should have used the string there. Or I should have used a certain type of object. Write it into your code. Accept that type as well. It doesn't really cost you anything, and it prevents pre people from making mistakes. Make the simple, easy, and the complex possible. If I could tell you one API design guideline, one UI design guideline, that would be it. That is the mark of good user interfaces and good APIs. Make the simple, easy, and the complex possible. Offer a way to do complex things, but do not depend on that way. Of also offer shortcuts for the common things. For example, we have this uh, method in the DOM, compare document position. It's a bit mask. You compare it with a number, um, or you can use a constant, as I've done in this case, so that my code is a little more readable. And this would be, this would be pretty bad without shortcuts, right? It's super confusing. Compare document position, it's so long. So, But thankfully, we also have a shortcut, node.contains. And that's one of the most common cases where we want to compare the document position of two nodes. So we have the shortcut for the common case, and we also have the big Swiss Army knife for the more complicated cases. Because compare document position doesn't just compare about contains, it also compares like, are they, is the, is the how, in what way are they related in the DOM? And it can be multiple things, that's why it's a bit mask. Um, my favorite example of overcomplicating things, enabling complex cases 
by uh, and making the simple cases harder is the SVG DOM. So here we had an innocent circle. You can see it here, just a circle with a, with a center and a radius. And we wanted to set the horizontal dimension of the center in JavaScript. So we tried to type, uh, we got a reference to the circle element, and then we tried to type circle.cx, because we wanted to get the CX value in JavaScript, right? We do this in HTML all the time. So we expect, what do, what do you expect this to return? How many think it's going to return 50, either as a string or a number, it doesn't matter here. How many think it's going to return 50? Quite a few, right? And if I hadn't warned you, it would be more. Well, actually, what it returns is SVG animated length. It's an object. And I can see in the console, it has a base val and an animated val. So I'm like, OK, uh, yeah, I can kind of see the point if smile was still a thing. So yeah, I, I guess I need base val. So I type circle.cx.base val. How many of you think this is going to return 50? I guess you're onto this, right? SVG length, it's still an object. But I can see it has a value property, so I can finally get my value by typing circle.cx.baseball.value, and I can finally get 50. Yay. Do not use the SVG, Tom. I don't know why it's designed in that way, but do not use it. Just use get attribute, set attribute, and save your sanity. I mean, it's not just how it, it, this whole length of these property chains. What if I didn't know about this? And I, I, I naively tried to just set circle.cx to some other value. Like, I wanted to change the center of this circle. So I did this. What do you expect to happen? Maybe an error? How many think it's going to error? I'm trying to set an object to, an a, to, 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 to a number. Maybe it should error, right? How many think it's going to work? So let's then try to get the actual value and see, did it actually work? Was the 5 applied? Is it 5 now? 50! Because the, the SVG DOM is just giving us a big old fat finger. Go to hell. You're not using my API in the way I want. I'll just ignore you. Yeah, whatever. You want to set it to 5? Fuck you. Next big API design guideline is parameter traps. You might have heard them as Boolean traps. How many of you have heard the term Boolean traps? OK, not many. So they're usually called Boolean traps because the biggest examples are with Booleans. Most Boolean parameters in not just JavaScript, any programming language, are bound to be confusing. Unless they're explicitly setting some Boolean property, they are going to be confusing. Look at this. You probably know what this parameter does, just because you've read the documentation. But it's not self-evident. Clone node true. OK, I want to clone, clone this node. And true. What is true? Hmm. Something is true. Yeah, it's the subtree. But it, 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 it's, it indicates, do I want to clone the subtree or just the shell, just the element itself? But is it self-evident? Does it make sense? You have to look at the documentation to make sense of this code. Here's another example. It makes sense that focus is the event, right? It's kind of self-evident. And you have a function there. It kind of makes sense. I'm adding an event listener on the focus event with the callback, with this callback, through. Through what? What is true? Am I actually adding the event listener? If, I, if it was false, would I not be adding the event listener? It, of course, you know that this is whether you're capturing or bubbling. but you know this because you've read books, you've read articles, you've read the documentation. It doesn't make sense on its own. And of course, why not go all the way and have tons, right? Why not just stop, why stop at one when we can have so many? Let's confuse people even more. And as you can see, it's not just uh, Boolean values that have this effect. I mean, key press makes sense here. Okay, I'm, in, I'm, I'm initializing a keyboard event. It's the key press event. It makes sense. 
what do all the other values mean? It's not self-evident. You have to read the documentation. Yes, some of you might know what... Actually, how many of you can understand what at least one of the other values mean? Exactly. So not only you have to read the documentation to understand one Boolean argument, but tons of them. And this is another one of my favorite examples. So you have to get a reference to the parent node to replace two nodes, and then you have to provide both children as the argument. How many of you know which one of the two that keep alternating is the correct one? Stop giving spoilers, Christian. Of course you know it. I can never remember. I, have, I always have to look it up. I always have to type MDN replace child and look it up. It's completely unpredictable. And, of course, Canvas. Canvas is full of functions with mystery numbers. What do these numbers do? If you read the Canvas tutorial, it will tell you something like, change these numbers to see what each of, with, what each of them is for. Can you imagine getting a microwave with unlabeled buttons? And then there's a label that says, press these buttons to see what each of them is for. Is that, because that's how I want to spend my morning, right? Or even in, in graphical UIs, we are way past these problems. Can you imagine, like you would be very pissed off if you got a dialogue with like a bunch of sliders and their labels were, yeah, first parameter, some other parameter, here's a third parameter, a fourth parameter. For definitions of what these parameters do, look at the documentation. That is not how graphical interfaces work. Why is this how our code works? So the example with the sliders and the example from the microwave is for, from Brett Victor's amazing essay called Learnable Programming. My slides actually have the link, but, oh, okay, it's there. Uh, it's kind of small. My slides are online. So in his essay, he made the case that these, um, these kinds of APIs are confusing, so we need better programming tools. Uh, and we need to change how we teach programming instead of telling people, hey, change these parameters randomly to see what they do. And that is a great point. But we can also make things easier by designing APIs better. Instead of having something like this with mystery numbers that I have to modify to see what they're for, why not have something like this? You can tell now what these numbers are for. The two first are for the, are for the center, then the radius, then the rotation. They're labeled now. Or if you want to go, to go even further, you can label each individual one. So now you know which one is the X and which one's the Y, but you lose the grouping, so you have to read every individual one. But both of them are valid approaches. Let's not forget that code is written once, but read many times, so we should optimize for readability instead of terseness. Yes. It's more, it's more characters if you have labeled parameters. But it makes such a huge difference when somebody's reading your code. And the things you, you think are obvious when you're writing said code are not obvious to other people or yourself in the future. So an obje the, the, the obvious solution is having one object literal argument. It gives you labeled parameters. No more guesswork about what everything does. It allows you to have parameters in any order, so you also uh, you're also saved from the replace child problem, and you can also make every parameter optional without having to worry about their order, because they don't have an order. Uh, modern APIs have started adopting this. How many of you know that that number two local string now accepts arguments and lets you format numbers? Here's another thing you can learn from this then, even though it's this, the talk is not about this. Um, so yeah, the old uh, number two local string method got uh, extra arguments now that let you format numbers. They, you can do digit grouping with like uh, commas, you can do uh, currency formatting, it's super useful. No, need, no more need for libraries for this. So uh, it, it has one mandatory argument, the locale, uh, which in this example is en. Uh, you can pass in, uh, I think the Israeli locale is il, right? Oh. Okay, that. Um, 
And all the optional arguments are in an object literal, so you don't have to remember what the order is or give or provide dummy values that don't mean anything. So here I've said this is a currency, and the currency is euros, and the currency display is by name, not by symbol, which is the default. And it prints out 50,000 euros with like a comma and everything. Another example is Advent Listener. So Advent Listener is starting to get more flags besides capture. So they, they realized at some point that, you know what? This cannot continue. Like we cannot have Advent Listener focus callback through false, through false, through false. Like what, what does this mean? So they adopted this pattern with the object literal. And now you can tell that through means capture. And you can also have other flags as well, like once. And ECMAScript 6 makes it even easier to provide default values for parameters straight in the, straight in the signature of the function. Uh, so here I've said, I have one parameter, the default value is an object, and this object has option one and option two, which also have default values of their own. So if I call this function without anything, without any parameters, I get the default values, no errors, nothing. Uh, if I call it with an empty object literal, I get the default values. If I call it with an object literal that only specifies one option, I get 42 as the value of that option and the default value for the other option. And this is supported pretty much everywhere now in modern browsers, but if you're, if you're too worried about old browsers, you can always transpile. The next deadly sin of usability, and not just for code, but also for UIs, unnecessary error conditions. Try to prevent error conditions instead of just throwing errors at people. For example, uh, if you have a number in graphical user interfaces, you can have an input where people type numbers, and if the number is bigger than what you expect, you can give them an error. Or you can have a slider and not let them pick a number out of range in the first place. So it's the same with code. Again, my, so let's create two elements, a div and a p. And now again, my favorite replace child example. So none of these elements have a parent. We didn't add them in the DOM. And now we're trying to replace uh, one with the other. You might argue that this is stupid. Why would I ever want to do that? But things like this happen. Like uh, in, in normal code, you can have, you can, you can, you might have set these variables ages ago and, you know, Things like that happen. Um, so what happens if I do this? How many of you think that nothing is going to happen? OK. How many of you think an error is going to happen? Not that many. So yeah, I get an error. Uncaught DOM exception, fail to execute replace child on node. The node to be replaced is not a child of this node. Yeah, I mean, I kind of expected that. But why? Why have an error condition in the first place? So the WG realized this at some point, and they added more methods that are easier to use, uh, like replace with. Unfortunately, it's not supported anywhere yet, but it will be soon. And that doesn't have an error condition, because you're not, you, don't have to repair, you don't have to refer to the parent node anymore. It's just the old child and the new child. No references to any parent nodes that need to be in sync. If I try to replace the div with the p, OK, nothing happens. Yeah, you have two floating DOM element references. I replaced them. Are you happy now? Order parameters by importance. This, this is exclusive to code. It doesn't really have much application in graphical interfaces. Uh, if, you, if you have parameters that people provide more frequently, and you're not using an object literal, so you, are, you actually have parameters that have an order, put them in order of importance, in order of how frequently are they used. Um, observe some people using your API. How frequently are they using each parameter? Th that parameter should be first. My favorite bad example of this is the history API. So every time I use the history API, I have to provide null and an empty string as the first two arguments. And then, only then, I can finally provide a URL as my third parameter, which is what I was actually interested in. I don't want to provide a state object. I don't want to provide a title. The browsers don't do anything with them. I just wanted to provide a URL. The URL should be first. I mean, I had to look up what these parameters actually do, because I've just gotten so much in the habit of just blindly typing null empty string every time I wanted to use the history API. 
Why? Why not just have this? I don't know. These are native APIs. We can't change them at this point. You can change your own code, though. Don't do these things. Double negatives. Thankfully, uh, most JavaScript APIs are kind of free of them. But there is still this old example. Disabled equals false. So what is disabled equals false? Mm. Right, so yeah, it's not disabled, so it's enabled. Ah, right. Why couldn't it have been like this in the first place? Why do I have to think what disabled? Why do I have to think in double negatives? Like, people have trouble thinking in double negatives. Disabled is not enabled. So just use enabled. This is a kind of controversial one. Um, so, and it, had, it has less importance than other, uh, than other uh, UX principles. But if you can, it, it, it's, it's good to live by it. So having Boolean parameters that are true by default is best to be avoided. Humans think of absence as a negative concept, not as a positive one. And also in JavaScript, as you know, Boolean parameters are not just true or false. They can also be undefined if you don't provide them. And seasoned JavaScript developers think of undefined as false, as falsy, because you know if you convert it to Boolean, it's false. So it's a little confusing if the default value of a Boolean parameter is true. So if I don't provide it, it's, it's true. But if I if I do provide it and it's false, it's it's false. It kind of it doesn't make much sense, does it? So clone node again. It's, as you can tell, it's one of my favorite examples. Um, so if you don't provide a value, then it's deep, which is a sensible default. I'm not arguing that if you don't provide a value, it shouldn't clone the entire subtree. That's what you want in most cases. But to clone, on, uh, to, do, to, to, clone uh, to only clone the, the element itself without the subtree, you have to provide the value false. So. It can, be, it can trip up people when they're still learning JavaScript. It's not, a, it's not a major point, but it can be a little confusing. It would, have been better, it, it would have been better if instead of the first parameter being deep, it, would, it, it was shallow. So if I provided false, it meant clone the whole subtree. If I provided true, it meant just clone the element. And the default value would still be the same. But like I said, it's, it's not a very important point. Like, in the, the number two local string, there's a parameter called use grouping, which is true by default. So it kind of violates this principle. So what should we do? How many, of the, how many think that it would be more usable if use grouping was false by default? Exactly. You usually want grouping. So it's good that grouping is on by default. Also, should I change the parameter name to no grouping? Mm -mm, that's a double negative. So in this case, you actually can't do much. Yeah, this parameter will be true by default, and that's probably the best design we can come up with. So this guideline is the lowest in priority compared to all the others we're going to discuss. Next one, chaining is good. Two salt chain. Uh, I'm sure before you started using frameworks or libraries, when you were still innocent and using vanilla JavaScript, or maybe some of you still do, you did something like this, right? How many of you have done something like this at some point? Quite a lot. So this is, this is getting very repetitive. Why do I have to keep typing audio all over again? If, if set attribute just returned the element that it's applied on instead of undefined, then I could just do this, which is still repetitive, but at least we've gotten rid of the element reference in the beginning. Or my favorite example of lack of chaining, Canvas. On Canvas, at least if you're not using a library, you have to keep typing the same methods again and again and again on, on, on the Canvas context. Why can't it just be this? Why can't I just not type the canvas con context over and over? And it's so simple, it pains me. 
It just takes returning this on every method of your class. It's one line, just return this if you haven't returned, if you haven't returned anything else. Returning undefined is wasteful. Why would, you why would you return undefined? It doesn't do anything. Nobody will use a value of undefined. People just won't use your return value. So why not just provide something that people can do, something useful with? You can even automate it. You can have a chainable function that you pass in a function and it, it makes it chainable. So you don't even have to type return this on every function. You just pass it through, uh, through a chainable function like this. A few years ago, I actually wrote this library called ChainVas, whose whole purpose was this, just enabling chaining on any API you pass to it. Like it had a plugin for DOM, Canvas, uh, hence the name. A while ago, I actually I got so pissed off that native APIs were not chainable that I made a library that let you th do things like this or like this on Canvas. So next commandment, supporting doing things en masse. Again, set attribute. Yeah, it has more than one problems with it. There are more than one problems with it. So it's not just chaining. Why do I have to keep uh, typing set attribute over and over and over again? I want to set multiple attributes on the same element. Why can't I just do this? It's, it's so much easier to read. When you don't have to ver mentally filter out the, the, re the repeated set attribute, you can just see what the code is actually doing. Or Another kind, of doing, another kind of doing things en masse, I, I, I want to apply, I want to set a, the, the attribute data foo on all the elements that have a certain class. So I have to get all these elements and then run a loop over them and, and call set attribute repeatedly on each one. Why can't I just do this? Why don't I have set attribute on node list too? A caveat with things like this uh, that I've seen many times, actually. It's yet, another, it's yet another case of making the complex easy and the simple impossible. Like what, this would also be really bad if I, if, I have to, if I had to provide an object every single time, even if I just wanted to set a name and a value. Because a lot of the time, yes, I just need a name and a value. So do not force people to use whatever API you've, de you've designed to make mass things easier. Provide a way for them to do the one thing and a way for them to do lots of things with one method. The next sin uh, is redundancy, forcing people to provide two parameters for things that if you can infer one from the other. Again, the old DOM is a prime example of this. Why, this always bugged me. Why do I have to provide a reference to the parent node to remove a child from the DOM? I, I, could, never, I could never wrap my head around this. It seems that the old DOM is designed in such a way that you have to keep doing dot parent node at all times. Like most... Even when people are writing vanilla JavaScript, they usually create a function that just removes a single node without having to keep referring to the, to the, to the parent node. Thankfully, now we've got element.remove, which solves this problem. And this is supported pretty much everywhere, actually. Many people don't know about it, but yep, at least we've gotten rid of that problem. Another case, insert before. Why do I have to go to the parent node if I just want to insert a node before another node? There, it's completely useless. Why can't I just, why can't the function itself uh, do element.parent node if it needs it? Which is why we got element.before. Sadly, it's not supported anywhere yet, but it's in the spec and it will be in a browser near you soon. And we also got after, as you can imagine. How many of you have written Java in your life? Whew, quite a few. So you're familiar with things like this. Get foo, set foo, 
JavaScript is not Java. You need to forget about this stuff. Yes, this is very common when you're writing Java. You define a bunch of private properties and then a bunch of boilerplate functions to set them and get them. And a lot of the time, what these functions are doing is just setting the property or getting the property without anything else. This is just Java developers guarding themselves against future changes. What if at some point I want to execute some code when the name is set? Or what if in the future we want to transform it in some way before it's get? So Java developers do this to avoid, to avoid, uh, to avoid having to change the API in the future. But in JavaScript, we don't need to do that. We can just have public properties. And if at some point we need to run code when, the, when these public properties are set or, or, or get, we can just use ECMAScript 5 accesses, which are supported everywhere, like even, even in IE8. So we can just, there's absolutely no reason to have two different methods just to set and get a property and have people mentally parse the, 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 the method name and having to figure out, oh yeah, this is just setting a value. Oh yeah, this is just getting a value. Yes, it's easy. It just takes us a few milliseconds to do it. But it's, it's even more overhead for our brains when we're reading code. Th something like this is much more obvious. I can see that the second line is an assignment. It's just setting the month to one. If it was, if it was not set month, yeah, I would, I would still be able to figure it out. But I would have to spend like a second thinking about it. And it's good if people don't have to spend precious seconds figuring out trivial things like this. Local storage is a curious case. It has a set item property uh, function and a get item function. And it lets you get and set arbitrary properties. But it also has, it also supports arbitrary properties right on the local storage object to get and set. So it's kind of both a whole, in a whole of fame example and a whole of shame example, because this is, this is just more verbose and I have to do more work when I'm reading it. This is nice and short. Uh, sure, you cannot do things like that with ECMAScript 5 accessors, uh, because accessors require you to have a certain property name that is fixed. And you can do dynamic stuff when this, that property is read. But you can do it with proxies. Proxies are awesome. So with proxies, you can pass in an object, and the proxy returns to you an object that mimics it in every way. Anything you do to the returned object is mirrored on the original object, if you make it so in the, in the functions you provide. So it has a bunch of traps, get, set, has, many different ones. And you can, you can control every aspect of how people use that object. Do they set a random property on it that doesn't exist? You can do stuff. You can respond to it. Do they get a property that doesn't exist? You can respond to that, too, in any way you want. So that was an example of uh, getting. Assuming I had a get item function in my object, this was an example of setting. There are 12 different traps, so you can really, do any, you can really control anything that happens on that, ob on that object. Naming, how, uh, as someone said, I forget exactly which one, there are two hard things, the two hardest things in computer science are naming things and, and cache invalidation. Who was it? Right, yes, and off by one errors. So I, I, don't, I have two guidelines for you about naming. Use few simple words and use them whole. Do not make people guess what an abbreviation means. Do not pointlessly use three or four words to name a function when one or two would suffice. It gives people more to read pointlessly. It makes them wonder, if I like remove a word, would I get a new method that actually does something? Uh, for example, parent node. Why is it parent node? We're so used to it that we don't question it anymore, but why is it parent node? Why is it not just element.parent? I've all, this always baffled me. And predictably enough, jQuery did do element dot, did do like jQuery object dot parent. Exactly because that's what makes sense. The, the, do, the old DOM is full of things like node, uh, parent node, child nodes, 
But it's also inconsistent with itself because we get first child and last child. But first child and last child are so we have element.child nodes and it's all the nodes, including ch including elements, text nodes, comments. Why couldn't that be element.children? And yes, I know you're about to, 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 to scream like, hey, element.children's taken. It's the, it's the children, uh, it's the element children. Yeah, but it, 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 why was it designed that way? First child is not the first element child. We have a separate property for that. Also, name should describe what it does, not how it works. Keep the technical details to yourself. Keep the technical details to your implementation. Your users, and by users I mean the other programmers using your code, which includes you in the future. Your users do not need to know how it works. They just need to use a function and, have, and get the expected result. This always baffled me, query selector all. Why? I don't think of this as, as querying. Uh, when, I th when I think of querying, I think of databases. I don't think of like getting elements by a selector as querying. And, yeah, and, and then we got these new methods, query and query all, which do have some differences. It's not just a renaming, but still. So yeah, these are shorter. These are better. It, it's, they, they don't have the pointless verbosity of the other ones, which, I mean, query selector all kind of makes me worry, uh, wonder, if is there are there other methods like query something else all uh, because wh that's that's what happens when you have a ton of words in your function names people people wonder like does this mean that they had to differentiate from some other function okay so query and query all don't have the verbosity problem but they do have the, the old technical term problem. I mean, do not expect that, mo that your users will have the same technical knowledge as you. There are people that are baffled if you use query because they don't have enough technical knowledge to be comfortable with terms like this. Assume that your users are the, the minimum amount of technical that is needed to use your API. Find and find all makes much more sense. I'm looking for elements that match this selector they make way more sense than this. Unfortunately, these were in the spec at some point. They're not going to happen, but they're not going to happen because they were bad for usability, just because they were conflicting with some version of jQuery in, in some cases. And this is kind of, a, of an interesting one, because based on most usability principles, using a dollar as your function name is a terrible idea. What does a dollar do? You see, you, you look at code, you see, dollars, uh, you, you see dollars everywhere, and you're like, what the hell? I see this all the time in people that are learning JavaScript now, and they, they are not used to this convention yet. They're like, what does this dollar do? Does it have to do with money? So in this, this is a case where this has become such a convention that it's accepted by now, even though if you asked someone before it became so popular, they would be like, this is a terrible idea. It's terrible for usability. You cannot make any sense of it. You can, it, it's, it's not readable. Just, just, give it a, just give it a word. Get if you want something short, not a dollar. But it's something that occurs so frequently in code that it ended up being OK, because we, we just learn it once, and then we see it everywhere and we're OK with it. Another deadly sin is expecting that your users will use boilerplate, like calling the same functions every time, you, every time they're using your API. Like, yeah, sure, if you use this, this first function, you have to use this and this and this as well. Well, if functions are used together, just make a helper function with them. Like, this is my favorite example of boilerplate. Just to do a simple request, you have to, to, to write one, two, three, four, lines of code, minimum. This, these are more because it's not minimum. I wanted to show an example with JSON just, just to make it even uglier. But just to do a simple HTTP request, that just a simple get request, you have, to write, you have to write four lines of code. And these four lines of code always go together. Isn't this so much cleaner? Just fetch with the URL, sensible defaults, 
get is the default. I don't need to provide it every single damn time. And then a promise. And I can get JSON out of my response if I want. Here I've, I'm transforming the response to JSON for the next function that I'm calling. If I wanted text, I wouldn't even have to do that. And by the way, this is supported pretty much everywhere now. Unfortunately, it doesn't do everything that XML HTTP request does, but it does most of the useful stuff. Uh, another thing that I can't, another principle that the DOM itself doesn't violate very much, like native APIs are usually pretty good when it comes to that, responding to changes. So I had, even though I wanted to make this talk uh, use native APIs for pretty much all examples, I realized that that wouldn't be feasible for all of them. So I did uh, include some good and bad examples from libraries, but I tried to keep them as short as possible uh, and as few as possible. So how many of you have heard of masonry? So it's a, it's a JavaScript library that lets you do complex layouts, like the ones shown here, the one on Flickr. Uh, like if you have a ton of elements with different dimensions, it lets you display them in a pretty way. It's, it's pretty good, I've used it. Um, the layouts it produces are nice. But it requires you to call a layout method anytime anything changes. If you add an element, you have to call the layout method so that the layout happens again. And this means that every single bit of code needs to know that I'm using this library. If I remove this library in the future, for whatever reason, I have to go to every bit of code that I've written and remove this function call. It, 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 re it results in really tightly coupled parts of code. We ca while we cannot respond to all possible changes, so methods like layout are still necessary, and they probably will be for the foreseeable future, we can respond to at least some changes. For example, if elements are added or removed, we can respond to changes like that. We could have a mutation observer that calls layout every time the child list changes. We don't even need to inspect what the mutation's par parameter is. The child list has changed. Let's relay out. It's only like a few lines. And, it, and mutation observers are supported pretty much everywhere. I think even on i9. And soon, we'll be able to respond to even more things, like resizing if an element changes dimensions for any, way, for any reason, or intersections if an element is covered by another element, or where the element is in the viewport, um, we can respond to changes like these. And even more along the future, there are the Houdini set of specs. It's a bunch of specs about, making, about giving developers access to native uh, browser APIs so they can add their own layout methods, for example. So things like masonry would be able to be done with uh, and, and behave almost like a native layout method. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, would someone please think of performance? I cannot just have a mutation observer there that keeps observing the, the child list. Like, this is, this is bad for performance, right? So first off, mutation events were bad for performance. That's the reason we got mutation observers. So if you've heard something about how mutation events are bad for performance, this does not apply to mutation observers. Mutation observers are an API designed to overcome all these issues. But also, of course, they don't come for free. They're cheap, but they're not free. So if you can, you should try to use them with restraint. Observe as little as possible. Do not add, for example, that I want to observe attributes as well if you don't actually need it. Uh, narrow scope as much as possible. Do not just observe anything on the document body if you can narrow your scope down to, say, just the grid element. Unobserve when you don't need, to, when you don't need them anymore. There's an unobserve method. Uh, actually, it's a disconnect method. Yeah. Uh, where it says unobserve there, mentally put disconnect. Uh, I had a brain fart when I was making this slide. And do not... Um, do not force it on your users. If your users care more about performance than about decoupling, you should give them that option. They're, make them opt in or opt out, depending on what you're coding. 
either have them on by default and provide a method to disable them, or have them off by default and provide a method to enable them. It, even if you have to call a method to enable this kind of monitoring, it's just one method, not a method I have to plaster all around my code every time something changes. One of the last, uh, one of the last things that is very specific to JavaScript a deadly sin of JavaScript usability is forgetting to use toString and two JSON methods in your classes. The toString method is called every time uh, your object needs to be converted to a string for whatever reason, such as when you concatenate it with a string. And my favorite bad example of this is the attribute class, the native attribute class. So if I try to convert the native uh, attribute class to a string, I get this useful thing. Object attribute. So useful, right? I can do a ton of things with it. This is just the default object to string method. Whoever wrote this, whoever wrote the spec for it, did not bother to define one. Why instead couldn't I have something useful? Like, I can define it even by myself. Do not do this, but do not do, 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 not do this to native classes. Um, but do this to your own classes. Do define two string methods that do something useful, such as, whoa, let's see. Yes, if I zoom out, that works. So on your own classes, do define two string methods. Uh, just for the lols, I defined it on the attribute class. And now if I, do, if I concatenate an attribute node with an empty string, I get class, which is much more useful. I could also use this dot value and have like an actual representation of the node, but anything, anything that is sort of anything other than the default is is much more useful. Uh, same with two uh, with two JSON uh, methods. The two JSON method controls how your object is stringified. So the date object has a two a two JSON method, which is pretty decent. It just gives you a serialization of date. And I mean, if you, if you want to store a date object in JSON, what else would you want? It has all the information you need to, to reconstruct the object. On the other hand, if you try to, to, to serialize a regex to JSON, you get nothing. This is just the default. If you do not provide the to JSON method in your objects, this is what you get, two braces. Hopefully, people are okay with that. Not really. And lastly, my time's up, but I hope I have five more minutes. So lastly, the best JavaScript API is no JavaScript API. Some of you, we're JavaScript developers, we do not often think about that. We think that everybody on the web platform knows JavaScript. Every developer knows JavaScript, right? But there are tons of people that only know HTML and CSS. And if you require even a line of JavaScript to use your code, they can't do it. Or they can do it clumsily. They, co they copy paste, and then they can't modify it. I asked a while ago, hey, people who write HTML and CSS, how many of you actually are comfortable with JavaScript? And half aren't very comfortable. Half, one in two. Only, only 51% said they're very comfortable with JavaScript. So, I mean, I understand there are, many, there are many libraries that just don't make sense without JavaScript. For example, jQuery. You can't have an HTML API for jQuery. It's a library for JavaScript developers. But there are many libraries for like widgets, like date pickers, uh, before we got native date pickers, accordions, uh, slideshows, um, autocompletes, a ton of libraries that do UI stuff, and you should be able to initialize them and provide settings declaratively. So before we could do sliders in HTML, people were using jQuery UI for sliders, and it looked like this. You needed to have something in your HTML anyway, like an element or something, and then you would call the slider method on it and provide all the parameters there. So if you wanted to change stuff, you had, to, you had to look in two places. Now, in native HTML, when we got sliders, 
Of course, there is a JavaScript API to them, but you can define them just with HTML, just declaratively. I can set a, a minimum, a maximum, the increment, uh, whether I want two handles or one. Sadly, the two handles are not supported anywhere. This is just a polyfill I wrote, um, but it's in the spec. Uh, so you can define tons of things declaratively, like anything that makes sense to be, de to be, this to be defined in HTML, you can define in HTML. And a few guidelines for providing HTML APIs for your libraries. Uh, accept classes for Boolean settings, like if something is on or off, uh, you can check if a class is there. Uh, attributes for other primitives, like strings, numbers, uh, you can have data attributes. Uh, if you want, if, if, one of, if, if a parameter is to an object, like, an, uh, like a collection, like a list of autocomplete values, for instance, you can't put all these in an attribute unless they're very small, so the attribute should accept a selector or an ID to another element that has all the options. And have an init setting, some, some class, um, some attribute that if I put it on an element, it initializes it without me having to call some function in JavaScript. For example, um, the, also, the also complete library that I wrote, it's an autocomplete library, it's going quite well, uh, so it really tries to follow this principle. Uh, you can provide the autocomplete options either in an, entirely in an HTML attribute, like comma separated, or you can link to another element. And in, it's also using the native HTML5 autocomplete as a fallback. And all the options can also be provided as data attributes, like data, dot, data hyphen min cars except the options that are functions. Like, you can't do anything with that. Like, you don't want people to be providing functions as, as HTML attributes. If they can write functions, they can provide them in JavaScript. But anything else, like numbers, strings, they can provide them in straight in the HTML. And also, make them inheritable. This is from Prism. It's a syntax highlighting library I wrote. Uh, and you, pro you specify the language of the highlighting via a class. And yes, I know this goes against what I just said where I was like, keep value pairs, use attributes. But this is what the HTML5 spec suggested for code examples. You, the HTML5 spec says, don't use the lang attribute, use a class, like language CSS or language JavaScript. So that's what I did. The, the main point is, these classes are inheritable. I can put a class on the body for what I expect most of my code examples to be about. Like, I've done it in, this, in these slides as well, actually. This saves people from a ton of verbosity in their HTML. Like, imagine if every inline code element had needed to have its own class. And if you have global settings, for example, another library I wrote is called Stretchy. It's about having auto-sizable inputs and text areas depending on the content. And it has a data filter it has a filter parameter that specifies which elements it should apply to. Otherwise, it just, it, it just applies to all form elements. And because this is a global setting, it's applied on the filter. So you, the script element can be a, ho a good host for global settings, but it shouldn't be the only one, because sometimes people do not control uh, what's on the script element if they're using like weird CMSs. So you should also, prov uh, you should also provide other ways. But if, and if you do it on the script, there is document.current script that lets you get a reference to the script element that the, current, uh, that the current code was included with. Then you can get whatever attribute from it. And hopefully, in, in the future, now that we're starting to get CSS variables, maybe we'll, we'll even have CSS APIs. I'm I, I, I've experimentally done something a bit like this in my multi-range polyfill for like multi-range, multi-handle sliders. So you can see in the API section, it has two sections. It has a JS one and the CSS one. And the CSS uh, section is like, use these variables if you want to change this thing. And I believe the more people start using CSS variables, the more we will see CSS APIs like this. And then they'll have their own talk about how to design them better. So. This is, uh, this is pretty much it. I hope you learned something. Uh, a few words before I leave you, kind of like general advice about usability. 
The first one is stay foolish. And this applies to any kind of usability, not just about code. Try to approach your interface like someone with very little technical knowledge and not that much IQ. How, where would they be confused? Be naive. Do not, do not, uh, I know that when you're writing code, you know a ton about it, and it's really, really hard to get into the mindset. But try to stay, try to stay in that mindset as, as much as possible. Cultivate this mindset for not just your projects, but other projects as well. It, it takes practice, but eventually you'll, you, you'll be able to like see interfaces and be like, yeah, I, I don't get this. And you might, you might actually get it, but you know that so someone else might not. And empathy is the most important thing about usability. Get into the mind of the user, the other programmers using your code. Be nice to them. Don't be a dick to them. Try, try to think, like, how, how would you want an interface to be? If, I was, if, I, if you were using an interface for whatever thing you're coding, how, would it, how should it be? How, how would it, what would be the most pleasant interface to use for this? And start coding after you've thought of that, because if you start coding before you think of that, you do what's easier to code, not what's best for usability. Think as a user first. Thank you very much. <laughs>